Hello everyone, I'm Eric Rivenis and welcome to the Most Notorious Podcast. I just want to remind everyone that my book, Dirty Doc Ames and the Scandal That Shook Minneapolis, is available, local Minnesota bookstores, and Amazon and Barnes & Noble online. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, author Nathan E. Bender. He's written the introduction for the new edition of the classic book, Crow Killer, The Saga of Liver Eating Johnson. So glad to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a a bit of an unusual interview for me in that you're not the original author of the book. It was written by Raymond W. Thorpe and Robert Bunker. But you were gracious enough to come on the podcast and talk about it anyway. How did you get involved with this incredible story? I was working at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center at the time. And at that time, Liver Eating Johnson's Hawk and Rifle and Bowie Knife uh, were donated to the uh, Buffalo Bill Museum, the Winchester Firearm Museum at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. And I was asked to uh, research do some background research to write captions for these items, which is very politically sensitive, given that the BBHC also houses the Plains Indian Museum there. And so I wanted to try to get a historically accurate caption for these items. So I started with the book Crow Killer, and what I was finding wasn't jiving with the historical manuscripts I was actually finding in the local historical archives, the local history collections, where I was librarian and archivist for local history collections, both at the museum and previously in Bozeman, Montana. And so his stories of him uh, being the crow killer and of going on this episodic story of revenge against the Crow Indians and cutting them open and eating their livers afterwards to show how brave he was or just to freak people out didn't match with the local historical archives. And so in order to write these captions for these items, I had to really figure out what was going on with the book. And I should also mention the movie Jeremiah Johnson. Most people know the story of Liberty Johnson through the movie Jeremiah Johnson, which came out in 1972. And that was such an incredibly powerful movie that it actually overshadowed all of the historical data and even this book Crow Killer, which was one of the main sources for the Jeremiah Johnson movie. So I got in touch with the historian for the Crow Indian Nation Joseph Medicine Crow, and he uh, told me that this book, Crow Killer by Thorpe, had no basis in reality, except that Liver E. Johnson, John Johnson, was a real person, and he was a great friend of the Crow Indians. And in fact, his own son-in-law was named after Liver Eating Johnson. It had become a, a name that was being passed down among the Crow Indians, among some of their family members. And so this was completely at odds with the Crow Killer book by Raymond Thorpe. And Raymond Thorpe died in 1966. He was no longer available to write to, but Robert Bunker was still alive. And I wrote to him and asked him some questions, and he wrote back to me and uh, pretty well told me he didn't have any of his papers anymore, but what he remembers in working with Raymond Thorpe, is that Thorpe had put together uh, this whole historical research project on the frontiersman, Liberty and Johnson, but it was it didn't hold together very well, and so Bunker told him he wouldn't wouldn't edit his book unless he could rewrite it and reimagine it. And actually, Thorpe gave him permission to do that, and by so doing, Bunker became the co-author of the book. And that, I think, is where the story of Johnson going on his revenge for the revenge of his wife and unborn child, that idea came from. Thorpe had introduced and established the idea of 
John Johnson going on a war against the Crow Indians just out of revenge for general purposes. But I think it was Bunker that introduced the theme of a romantic idea and a very powerfully driven idea that it was for the revenge of his family. And that made a big difference in the book and its popularity and influence the later writer Vardis Fisher, who in 1965 wrote the novel Mountain Man. And Fisher is a superb novelist. And it was a great, Mountain Man book is a great book. And it was largely because of that Mountain Man book, which John Johnson was not portrayed as a cannibal. And, but just as a mountain man seeking revenge against an entire tribe of Indians, that the story became picked up by the movie Jeremiah Johnson. They merged those two books together to write the screenplay for Jeremiah Johnson. And then Robert Redford came in and did a superb acting job for the movie. And it's still one of the absolute classics of Western cinema. Oh, interesting. So when Raymond Thorpe was doing his research, a lot of it was based on interviews he did with people who knew Liver Eating Johnson, right? Yeah. He had two main oral sources for Robert, for Raymond Thorpe. He had two main sources, White Eye Anderson, who was, uh, had been a former trapping partner with John Johnson. And then there was Doc Carver, who was the Wild West showman who had, for the first year in 1883, had partnered with Buffalo Bill Cody when they came up with the idea of the Wild West show circus. After that first year of 1883, between the partnership of Carver and Cody, uh, they couldn't stand each other. They hated each other, and they both went their separate ways. Buffalo Bill went on to establish his own Wild West show, which became spectacularly successful around the, the world. And Doc Carver had his own Wild West show, which was a competing show that traveled around quite a bit as well. And Raymond Thorpe wrote a biography of Doc Carver and got some information about Wild West shows and, that, and such from this. The reason this is important is because in 1884, Liv Reading Johnson got together with Calamity Jane and Curly, from the, who had been a scout for General Custer at the Little Bighorn, and they got funding from uh, some of the whiskey post traders up in Canada to fund a Wild West show, uh, Harding's Wild West show. And so Liberty Johnson actually started his own Wild West show with Calamity Jane in 1884, and they hired Crow Indians to to do sham battle reenactments of the Little Bighorn battle. And so they were a direct competitor with Doc Carver and Buffalo Bill in 1884 during that first critical year. So Doc Carver would have known about Liv Reading Johnson, because he was one of his direct competitors for the Wild West Show audience. And he was a main source of information for Raymond Thorpe, who did the Crow Killer book. And I think this is where Thorpe got the idea that John Johnson was at war with the Crow Indians, is because Johnson had hired and was working with Crow Indians in the Wild West Show doing reenactments of battle scenes where Johnson was fighting Crow Indians in his Wild West show. And I think that somehow Thorpe got the idea that this was a true story, that Johnson had fought a war against the Crow Indians, and he took that as his starting point, and then went through and did historical research and sort of force-fit historical sources into this theory of the Crow Killer. Then Robert Bunker came by and reimagined the book and put the more romantic uh, revenge for a murder of his family as a big engine of motivation and romance behind the story and uh, acquired considerably more uh, romantic power as a result of that. So because it it really is a a compelling narrative, I mean, the the story is amazing. I'd I'd already read your introduction, so I kind of knew what was going on here (laughs) when I began to tackle the story. 
but it really reads like a, a tall tale, like a Pecos Bill or a Paul Bunyan type of story. Yeah, that is exactly right. And Raymond Thorpe has written to other historians, which I've seen his correspondence, where he is telling them that he had read a lot of the dime novel stories, the adventure stories of the Western figures, and was impressed that many of the early dime novels were based on real historical people. And he was he read a lot of those as a youth growing up, and I think they had a big influence on him. So when he came time to write his own, no dime novels had been written about Liv Reading Johnson before. He sort of used that as sort of a pattern for writing these stories about his hero and tried to make Johnson into the greatest heroic mountain man who ever lived. He pre- he presented the Crow Killer book as a biography that corrected historical accounts and is the true story of Liver Eating Johnson. And the po- story was so powerful and was such an interesting idea of this one man fighting this whole tribe of Indians that many historians just referred to Crow Killer as the is the biography of Livery and Johnson and never really questioned it. And this went on for, you know, 40 years before people really seriously did serious critiques of the book. Um, when it was republished in 1969, uh, the president of the American Folklore Society wrote an introduction for the 1969 edition of the book and basically validated that this was all good information. <laughs> and, and so it became sort of this Western classic. A lot of people thought it was legitimate history, but even though it was presented in this novelized, almost historical fiction, the way it was presented in the book, except the book claims that it's a true history. So if you don't mind, I'd like to approach things this way. I'd I'd like to go through some of these little stories in the book one by one. Perhaps talk about what's historically accurate and what's not. Yeah, there's some some really interesting stories in the book. Uh, One is the, uh, well, the story of how he got his name of Liv Reading Johnson. Now, in the book itself, he just sort of hedges and hodges around as to how he actually acquired the name. But, said, but Thorpe said that he only ate delivers of Crow Indians. In the historical accounts, there is pretty specific. You find the various versions of the story of how he got his name. And that's one of the main reasons for telling stories about Levine Johnson is how he got his name. You find a lot of these newspaper accounts about it, but they mostly date to the late 1860s, 1868 to 1870. And I think the actual incident was in May 1869 on the Muscle Shell River at a trading post where he was working as a wolfer in the winter where they'd, they would set out strychnine poison baits and the wolves would eat them and die. And in the winter, dead bodies would freeze then they'd go along with a wagon and pick up the dead bodies of the wolves and uh, then take them back to the, the trading post and skin them out and that. So they were known as wolfers. Well, there was about 20 of these people, and the head of this at this trading post had a very beautiful, young, blonde wife who was living with them. And basically, the story is all the men at the trading post were in love with this woman. She was just so wonderful. In the spring of that year, they got attacked by Indians. And this young woman, and she had a, there was also a young Indian woman living with them at the time. They were down at the river getting water, and they uh, got attacked by the Indians and got scalped. The young Indian woman got away, but uh, was shot in the thigh and made it back to the fort. And the, the rest of the men came down and got the, the woman back up the fort, and she was still alive. And they chased off this small war party that had attacked them. For the next several weeks, they all the men were uh, 
acting as doctor for this woman where she had been scalped and trying to heal up her scalp on her head. And there you go. They were all extremely furious about this. Well, about a month later, another war party or party of Indians came and tried to attack the trading post. But this time, the men were ready for them. And at this time, 1869, they had uh, repeating rifles. And they forced the Indians into a narrow ravine uh, where they couldn't get out. And then they stationed themselves at front of the ravine and just shot with their repeating rifles into this ravine and killed like 20 or 30 of these guys who were apparently Sioux Indians. At that time, they uh, pulled all the bodies out of the ravine as they started. At this time, they could sell the heads to the, and they boiled out the body parts. So they would boil out the skulls and sell the skulls to people coming by on the steamships coming down the Muscle Shell River uh, to the tourists and stuff. And they actually dismembered all the bodies so they had the legs in one pile, the arms in another pile, and all this. I don't know why they were doing that, but they were extremely bloodied up during this process. At the bottom of the pile, they found one Indian who was still alive. And apparently, uh, Liberty Johnson stuck his knife into the guy and pulled out his liver and said, hey, anybody want to eat a lo- eat some raw liver? And just, according to some of the people, he took a bite of it and uh, ate it. Given this gruesome circumstance, this was very dark humor at the time, and he got acquired, acquired the name Liver Eating Johnson at that time. Later, they tried to go back and say he was just making a joke and just pretended to eat the piece of liver. But this guy had a huge, bushy beard it would be very easy for him to uh, just pretend to do that as opposed to actually doing it. It's not really known. He was also known as being a great practical joker. There's a lot of stories about him playing all sorts of tricks on people and and jokes and stuff like that. So it's, it's also within his persona to have pretended to do it. So it, even today, we don't really know if he actually ate the liver or not. But that was a a big part of the stories about him was whether or not he actually ate the liver. Even your description of him being a a practical joker, that's not the liver-eating Johnson portrayed in the book. He's he's a man who doesn't seem to talk much, quiet, stoic. He's also physically very large in the book. The authors say he was over six foot, 260 pounds, and you already mentioned he had a, a big, thick beard. That's the last description of him. According to his Civil War records, he was like five foot ten and weighed about 160. <laughs> but over time, he kept growing taller and heavier and more muscular. Uh huh. However, interesting. With the, yeah, with the Crow Indians, however, one of his one of his nicknames was Black Bear. So he was sort of a big burly guy. That one of his nicknames was Black Bear. Besides calling him liver, they also claim to give him, have given him the name liver eating because he was the one white man they knew who would eat raw deer liver with them. So they claim that he got his name from eating raw deer liver with them. Now, the Crow were traditional enemies of the Sioux and the Blackfeet. And so the historic liver eating Johnson did a lot of fighting against the Sioux and the Blackfeet, if not outright murder of, of many of them. Um, yeah, but he was allied with the Crow Indians, and he served as an Army scout in 1877 with Crow Indian scouts uh, during the Nez Perce War. What year was he born? About 1824 in Little York, New Jersey, although we've yet to find an actual birth certificate. At least I haven't seen it yet. There's stories about his family name. The name Garrison comes up. And it's not known if he was born a Garrison or if his mother remarried to a man named Garrison. Uh, now, there's, I've seen one newspaper report that his family name, that he was born in a family with the name Garrison, even though he used the name Johnson. And there's stories about him being in the Navy early on and having served as a whaler out on the ocean in his, in his younger adult years before he came west. Historically, he doesn't show up in the historical local history records until uh, he was at the gold fields 
of Virginia City and Alder Gulch in 1862. Although in some of Johnson's letters to the editors who wrote the newspapers, he actually talks about being in California earlier. So he may have been part of the California gold rush earlier on. You're giving us such a different description of him than, than how he's described in the book. Well, there's two different traditions of him. One is the historical local history tradition, and the other is started with the book Crow Killer and turned into the movie Jeremiah Johnson. So we have the popular culture stories of him, which are different from the local history. One of the other great stories about him is what uh, Thorpe calls the Blackfoot leg, where he got captured by the Blackfoot and then cut off a leg of one of the Blackfeet. Uh, and took it with him while he ran away from them and then ate off the leg to get back to one of the forts. And then he used the the leg to fight off a a grizzly bear. (laughs) Yeah, and a panther. And so there's all kinds of stories related to this. I found in the WPA papers there's a story where they were attacked by Indians and Johnson's trapping partner got killed and he cut off his partner's leg and use that to eat off of while he rode back to the fort. It wasn't his Indian leg. It was from a white man's leg. Then there's also a story uh, from Boone Helm, who was captured by Native Americans and who uh, cut off one of their legs. and He made it back to safety and ate off that leg. And apparently these two stories have gotten overlapped and merged. Uh, that the story of Livian Johnson has got mixed up with the story of Boone Helm, who is also another cannibal in the American West. So just to expand on this story about the leg, it basically goes like this. Liver Eating Johnson was bringing whiskey to sell or trade to one of the, the tribes he was friendly with when he was waylaid by Blackfeet Braves. They captured him, tied him up, and chose a young inexperienced brave to guard him while the rest of them began drinking the whiskey. So Johnson took advantage of this, of course, took advantage of the youth's inexperience, broke free and ripped the boy's leg off with his almost superhuman strength. And then he he snuck by the drunken partiers before escaping with the leg into the night. And, And the whole thing is made up and passed off as history. Right. It's one of uh, Raymond Thorpe's stories, <laughs> and rewritten by Bunker. And so it's hard to say, you know, how much of it was derived. Thorpe himself has been criticized in several of his books for taking little newspaper accounts of something and then attributing them to oral sources that he was using and enlarging upon them and making them fit into his story. He also wrote a book in 1948 about Bowie knives. And some of the stories about Jim Bowie are these great stories that Walt Disney later picked up on for the story of Jim Bowie's stuff were sort of invented by Raymond Thorpe. So he's had some impact on our understanding of American history and American Western heroes, also with Jim Bowie. (laughs) Some of these stories about forging the Bowie knife out of meteoric iron, some of these stories about that apparently also were influenced by uh, Thorpe's telling. The stories of Doc Carver were also historians have criticized those as not being factually correct. You mentioned the Bowie knife, and, and I wanted to ask you about that for my next question. So, a nice segue. Um, Thorpe makes a big, big deal about the weapons that Liver Eating Johnson carried with him, along yeah. with his fighting style. Can can you describe the weapons he was alleged to have carried with him? Yes. Yeah, Raymond Thorpe attributed him to uh, having acquired this uh, rosewood-handled 14-inch blade, long blade bowie knife and uh, some matching firearms that he got from uh, some European uh, noble dignitary that was hunting out west uh, from him. And then he also had a, uh, a war club, uh, Plains Indian style war club with a rock in the end of it, sewn in rawhide that they would use to crack people's skulls in with. His hawk and rifle, and bowling knife that were actually donated to 
the uh, Buffalo Bill Historical Center, now the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, those are on display there. Those were probably the last items that he owned. He gave away to a major Alderson, the newspaper editor in Bozeman, Montana, when he before he went west to California to the old soldier's home, where he died just a few months later. So his Hawk and Rifle is actually a late period Hawk and Rifle, possibly even made either by Samuel Hawkins and his crew or by J.P. Jemmer, who took over the Hawk and factories in the late 1860s. And then the Bowie knife was a Sheffield, Wade and Sheffield knife from out of Sheffield, England. Uh, and that dates from the mid-19th century, approximately. It's hard to get an exact date on it. But, but that one, that knife, actual knife has uh, antler steel handles, not rosewood handle, and it's about four or five inches shorter than what was described in the Crow Killer book. So it's not the exact same knife. And the Hawk and Rifle fits in with the his, local historical archives accounts. Now, having said all of that, one of the main themes about Johnson is that he was an expert marksman, and he kept up with all the latest advances in breech-loading rifles, black powder rifles, and that he even some accounts of him putting telescopic sights on some of his rifles. Um, he had a Spencer repeating rifle that had been customized by the Hawkins, and that's on display at the uh, Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And in fact, that may have been the, the actual rifle that he used at that time up on the Musselshell River when he got his name, Liberating Johnson. A lot of his newspaper accounts also emphasizes uh, what an expert marksman was. And it, there's a picture of him holding a sharps rifle, which was a very well thought of single shot black powder rifle used during the buffalo hunting days out west. And in, that's probably a publicity picture from his uh, Wild West show days. Part of what made him unique was the way he fought, according to Thorpe. He, he would kick his opponents first. Yeah, and I'm not sure where that came. Actually, I came across, there was a biography of a Texas lawman, the guy who uh, captured Bonnie and Clyde, this Texas lawman, uh, one of the Texas Rangers. And he had very similar stories written about him. And I think Raymond Thorpe might have read those stories about this Texas Ranger and incorporated that into his stories about John Johnston. Because I've never read about that in any of the sources I've read about Johnston. And I've researched him now for like 20-some years and all of the original sources as I could find. I've never found that about that thing about him kicking people, but it does show up very well. And I think one of the models that Raymond Thorpe used was the story of this Texas Ranger, the guy who captured Bonnie and Clyde, who became very, very famous. And there was a lot written in in the popular uh, press at the time about this guy. And I think that may have influenced Raymond Thorpe to pick up some of that information and put it into his persona of liberating, his rewritten crow killer persona of liberating Johnson in that tradition. It's interesting, it shows up in the Jeremiah Johnson movie where he, he jumps up and kicks somebody in one of the scenes in the movie like that. So I want to summarize briefly the central fable in the book, which you've talked a bit about this blood feud Jeremiah Johnson had with the Crow Indians. As the story goes, Johnson, who was friends with the Flathead tribe, uh, wed one of their young women, whom Thorpe called the Swan because of her beauty, I assume. She went back with him to his mountain cabin. He taught her how to shoot, treated her well. They had a romantic first year or so together. And then Johnson went out to trap and left her alone. And when he returned, he found that a group of Crow braves had come to his house, murdered her with an axe, if I remember right. And he finds not yes. only her skull, now picked away clean by animals, but the, the tiny skull of a baby. And he didn't know she'd been pregnant, right? Right, right. Which increases the drama, of course. 
as he promptly sets out to avenge their deaths. He comes across a band of crow pretty quickly, begins to kill them before the camp wakes up. Mm-hmm. And he believed that one of the men he kills was responsible for his wife's murder. I'm not exactly sure how he knows that this was the specific man responsible. Well, he was an expert tracker, so. Oh, okay. So then he goes to the Flathead tribe where he tells his wife's father about what happened, and then the Flathead go out and get revenge on the remaining members of the party he'd surprised. But that's not all. He he basically single-handedly went to war with the Crow Nation, and the Crow chief decided to handpick 20 of his strongest, smartest, best fighters to hunt Johnson. Yeah. And not together, because that would have been cowardly, but one by one. They found him. He killed each one in hand-to-hand combat. I mean, this really does sound like a movie plot, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, you know, parts of this, this is this story created by Thorpe and Bunker. But there's also, there was, I think this relates to some of the history up in Canada during uh, Fort Whoop Up, the Whoop Up Trail. Uh, between 1869 and 1874, before the Royal Canadian Mounted Police moved, and this is when uh, you know Canada was establishing itself as independent from Great Britain, and so the the British government moved out, and the Canadians hadn't moved in yet, and they were they called it Whoop Up Country because there was no established governmental authority there, and so basically the fur traders and the trading post people created their own mountain man armies that were creating local vigilante law and were uh, fighting uh, the Blackfeet Indians up in Western Canada at this time. And Johnson appears to have been a part of that. And I think that's where some of this mountain man army story may be related to. And so that's what's so interesting about this story. I mean, you can, it's easy to just, just dismiss the whole thing. Oh, they made it up, but there's threads of tradition and historical tradition running through this that can actually be related to real events. And we don't know how much of these Thorpe actually had picked up on and which he actually knew about and how they may have influenced the story. But there, that apparently there were some stories about this that were published in newspapers at the time as like serialized books, and uh, he would have been able to, uh, he spent a lot of time reading the old newspapers, and I think it's very likely he would have found those stories, and it influenced his book. So what do you what do you think about all this? It, it, and, it, and it's not just with Liver Eating Johnson, but with figures like Mike Fink, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett. What was the, the point in making these these men into mythological figures? Well, actually, it became American heroes and this manifest destiny and the progress of the conquering of the continent. These were the heroes. And I think, one, liver-eating Johnson himself, for his own self-promotion and his Wild West show, actually modeled himself on one of the Indian killers from a Pennsylvania, New Jersey area named Tom Quick back in 1756 during the French and Indian War. Uh, Tom Quick was one of the colonial families. Uh, His family had been friends with the Delaware Indians, and when the French and Indian War developed, the the, uh, Delaware sided with the French and attacked his family and killed a lot of his family. He then declared a one-man war on the Delaware Indians for the rest of his life. And apparently he would just shoot them on sight just in the woods when he saw them. At the time of his death, he reportedly had killed 99 uh, American Indians in revenge for this. And this is a story I think Liberty Johnson would have heard while he was growing up. And interesting, one of his newspaper accounts in the 1880s, when they were asking him how many Indians he had killed, and he said, 1,299. And with Tom Quick, on his death, that he was saying, let me up, let me up, I just want one more, make it an even 100. And I think it's interesting that 
when Johnson herself was told the reporter it was 99, 1,299, it was like there was, you just needed one more to make it an even number. Interesting. Yeah, I see the parallel there. And he supposedly killed a lot of Indians during the Civil War, right? He joined the Union Cavalry. Yeah, and I think this is where, uh, where Thorpe and Bunk really credited him with like, Three or four hundred killing three or four hundred American Indians, and I actually during the Civil War he may have been involved with some of the uh, the western on the western he was in the Colorado Cavalry they may have been fighting some of these uh, Civil War uh, American Indian units uh, from like Oklahoma and in Texas and such where they had recruited American Indians. Uh, particularly in Oklahoma, I know this is the case. And I think they may have been involved in some of those fights. He may have gone around and collected scalps from some of the uh, people that were in some of those battles. That's, that is a theory that uh, I have uh, encountered. Well, I don't know if that's historically accurate or not, but I have heard that as a possibility as to how he might have attained those numbers. I mean, there's so much about this guy which is so fuzzy and so vague, and people have their own individual theories about what may or may not have happened. Uh, it's it's really is works its way into popular culture at many different levels. And it's really hard to get hard and fast black and white answers, yes or no, about this guy. It's all we think this happened. Maybe this happened. Here's an interesting parallel that might have influenced it. And it's one of the reasons he's so fascinating because it's interwoven with actual historical events that he might very well, the real historical person, might have been involved with. One of these characters that kind of weaves in and out of the story is someone called Crazy Woman. Yeah. And she was a member of the Morgan family. You know, they're actually the Crazy Mountains in Montana are named after a woman who went crazy up there. And that may have, there actually, there are stories like that out west here. And Johnson, and that was a big story in the Jeremiah Johnson film, his relationship with that. And Johnson did spend a lot of time up in Montana. He's, he's spent more time in Montana than most of the other states. So there may very well have been some sort of a linkage there in, in those stories with Johnson. I cannot discount the possibility that he may have been uh, uh, involved with some of that. But the story that you know is written up as the family was uh, they had, were homesteading the settlers and they got attacked by Indians. A lot of their family members were killed and buried on site, and the woman just stayed at that site and tended to graze and just eventually went crazy. So Liver Eating Johnson is not the only mountain man that's written about in this book. There are many others, some with equally colorful names and and larger-than-life attributes. And at one point, they all gather together. And this happens after the part of the story when Johnson escaped with the Blackfoot leg. They wanted to avenge their friend's treatment, so they assemble as this large group to attack and then kill an entire encampment of Blackfeet Braves. Mm-hmm. Could, could you talk about some of these guys, who they were, and, and how mythical versus historical they really were? Oh, uh, well, there were a lot of mountain men uh, out in the West here uh, for the beaver trapping in the 1840s. And then even after that, a lot of them found employment as being guides for the Westward movement people, and they were still selling deer out in buffalo hides uh, after that. So they didn't just disappear. They sort of changed professions um, as the West generally filled in and got settled by uh, American Europeans uh, at the time. And they say up in Canada, Fort Whoop up is where this this idea of these mountain man armies may have actually uh, happened uh, to some extent. And, and that's where there a lot of fighting with the Blackfeet occurred at that. Now, White Eye Anderson was one of his trapping partners. And this Del Q is who, in the Crow Killer book, supposedly transferred a lot of these stories. 
is historically Dokyu is barely mentioned at all anywhere. It, it looks like they may have trapped the story of the poisoned biscuits in the crow color stuff. Dokyu is involved with that, and White Eye Anderson was with that. And the story there is that they were uh, surrounded by American Indians. And I've found this same story in local history sources. And sometimes it's Sioux Indians, sometimes it's Blackfeet Indians. They had these guys surrounded. But the story is that they left uh, poisoned food out for them and then slipped away under cover of darkness and made their escape. It, interesting, he seems to have reenacted that story in his Wild West show in 1884, where he set up a teepee and put a poison food in it and uh, went away. Um, I've also run across accounts that some, just the general settlers of the time, would poison sacks of flour with strychnine and leave it on the trail behind them because they thought Indians were following them or something. And this actually did happen in the Western history, where people would mix strychnine in with flour and either give it to the Indians to trade or leave it for them to find, or they would cook food with it. that They would poison just like they were wolves or something like that. Uh, it was one of the tragic aspects of the, the settling of the West like that and how American Indians were treated. Uh, as wild animals to be exterminated. And that's a, a lot of this book. It, it uses some um, pretty strong and often racist language, and it's definitely a product of its time. Yeah, that's how, that's how, that's how he, he says, actually says that in the introduction of the book, that he's intentionally doing that. And if you actually read Herman Melville from the 19th century, he actually wrote an essay called The Indian Hater, and he talks about this explicitly, how some of these Western people just hated Indians. A lot of them came out of the Ohio River Valley Indian Wars, where their families had been killed during those wars, during the settlement of the Great Lakes, Ohio River Valley area, and then moved west onto the plains, where they were predisposed and predetermined to hate Indians, and just lumped them all together as a single entity. In fact, I've run across some criticisms of Liv Reading Johnson historically, people saying there's people like him that led to a lot of the tensions in the American West because they just kept killing Indian people because they met just indiscriminately, which didn't go a long way towards establishing good relations between whites and Indians at the time. So you mentioned earlier that the Crows, to this, to this day, deny that they hunted Johnson or that he hunted them. Can you talk more about the relationship between Liver Reading Johnson and, and the Crow people? Yeah, historically, he never went to war against the Crow Indians, period. I mean, that's all this creation of Thorpe and Bunker started that idea on that. And then it just became unchallenged by historians for 30, 40 years and develops into popular culture as, as a is an accepted event, but it's totally fictitious. It never actually happened. Johnson was fighting Sioux and Blackfeet, who were fighting a lot of the Western settlers at that, that time. That's where a lot of the historic Indian wars were based with the Sioux and the Cheyenne and Arapaho and Blackfeet here on the northern plains. But uh, the Crow Indians were also at war with a lot of these same tribes, and they were using uh, Americans as their allies to fight their traditional enemies. And so a lot of the Crow Indians were employed as scouts by the U.S. Army and such. And that was where uh, Johnson maybe first came in contact with them, where he was scouting with them. He later actually lived at Crow Agency. He re reputedly had an Indian wife at the time. Although he wrote a letter to the Billings Gazette newspaper and denied those accusations. And even though he had said he was living with the Crow Indians at the time, he denied that he actually had a Crow Indian wife. He didn't like that idea that an um, officer of the U.S. Army had said that he had been married into the Crow tribe. However, in 1884, uh, because he knew these people very well and had been living with them, those were the people he hired in 
for the Wild West show that he was in. And the show went bankrupt after the end of one year with he and Calamity Jane and Curly as the main stars. But they, one of the reenactments of the battles they did in this Wild West show was a Little Bighorn. And after he worked his name and how he got his name is that he claimed during the Wild West show performance that he was he killed an Indian in revenge for General Custer. And it was the first scalp taken that Buffalo Buffalo Bill had his scene in his Wild West show about the first scalp taken to revenge Custer, which was actually where Buffalo Bill Cody had been a scout for the Army and actually had taken a scalp in revenge for Custer. And he reenacted that in his Wild West show. And Liberty Johnson of Wild West show, he reenacted that he had killed an Indian, but instead of taking his scalp, he cut him open and ate part of his liver. And so he's actually the first liver for Custer, was what he reenacted in his Wild West show. But Buffalo Bill Coley took the first scalp for Custer in his Wild West show. So it was basically a game of one-upmanship, right? Yeah, yeah. They were comp- directly competing with each other. So, so what happens to Johnson later in life after his stint as a mountain man? I mean, I know he had a show. Yeah, he... In eighteen in eighteen eighty, he became uh, a uh, after he had been a scout with with the with the army. He uh, went to Red Lodge, Montana, and was uh, became a sheriff there uh, for a few years. And then he sort of retired in the Red Lodge, Montana. He was out of the base of operations. He was around Billings. He actually uh, was raising cabbages on an island in the Yellowstone River and then sold the cabbages in town at the end of the year. He did that for like one year, but didn't make as much of a profit as he thought he might. So he went back uh, up to Red Lodge and was hunting and trapping and just living in town, working as a, doing some local law enforcement. And then his log cabin is up at Red Lodge. They have in the public square in Red Lodge, you could visit the cabin, Levine Johnson's log cabin there. And that was where he spent the last 10 years of his life or so. And he was like writing up his memoirs at the time because he wanted to try to make more money off of his uh, historical persona. And that's when a lot of the newspaper reporters came by and interviewed him during those years and got his stories. So there's a lot of newspaper accounts that he gave to newspapers in which he was proclaiming himself as this heroic figure in the American West. And then Thorpe came by and found these newspaper accounts of Johnson, these interviews with him, and that became a lot of the basis for his Crow Killer book. What I find interesting is that in these Wild West show, these sham battles with American Indians in his Wild West show that later almost led to the Jeremiah Johnson movie, where he was like the main actor as the hero, heroic mountain man in his Wild West show, and then Later on, 100 years later, the Jeremiah Johnson movie comes out and where he's portrayed in a similar fashion. Um, It was almost like he wrote the original screenplay for it. How how long was he a sheriff in Red Red Lodge, Montana? He shows up in their records there for, I think, three or four years he was doing that. And he was in his, what, his 60s? Yeah, he was older then. He was older then. It tells about him getting into fights with some people, and he was feeling his age, and so he was trying to knock him out with, like, one big punch right at the beginning of the fight because he wasn't sure if he had enough stamina to make it to the end of a fight. So it went on for a long time, and and picking people up, people up and knocking their heads together because they didn't have a jail at the time, so he'd just beat them up and tell them not, not to do it again. <laughs> Are there any good stories that you came across in your research about Johnson that, that Thorpe and Bunker didn't include in their book that were actually true? Yeah, yeah. I have one funny one from uh, when he was up in Red Lodge. He was noted for his prodigious appetite and just eating huge amounts of food. And I found that some accounts of parents they would threaten their children with bad behavior. The Liberty Johnson would come after them if they, if they weren't being good. But if they were good, they would invite Johnson to their house and they, they would get to watch him eat. <laughs> 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 he would just eat huge amounts of food at one time. 
and then just go for a long time without eating, which is sort of the feast and famine life of the, of your hunters and trappers out west on when you're living off the land like that. These buffalo hunters, they'd kill buffalo and they'd gorge themselves because they didn't know how long it would be before they'd get to eat again. I mean, they might be able to dry some meat and take it with them, but but uh, they there's talk to these guys eating like 10 or 12 pounds of meat at a time and stuff like this and just gorging themselves on it. I guess in an era without streaming video, you, you look for entertainment wherever you can find it, um, even if it means watching Liver Eating Johnson eat. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um well this has been great. Uh so so Crow Killer is available pretty much everywhere, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, this new edition from Indiana University Press uh came out in uh, like January twenty sixteen, December twenty fifteen. And it's uh, still available. Uh, and that's one that's the third edition. They call it the new edition. And your introduction is really wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. And what about you? What if people want to learn more about you and what you've done? Well, my next book is coming out next month um, from McFarland Publishers called The Art of the English Trade Gun in North America. And it's an analysis of the ornamentation that the English British used on when they designed guns to trade to American Indians and why they chose specific ornamental patterns uh, for American Indian peoples that they were trading to. And so that turned out to be far more multi-level symbolic analysis than I had ever anticipated and goes back to all sorts of symbols of liberty of the American Revolution that the American colonists were using at the time and symbols of the allegorical America based on old European mythology that they were working into and of uh, the dragon side plate on the American Indian trade guns uh, relating to St. George and earlier uh, to uh, Apollo, the god Apollo uh, and uh, Python, or Apollo and Python symbolism and St. George and the later was St. George and the dragon who was so important to English and those dragon side plates on the side of the trade guns that they traded to American Indians. Wow, it sounds good. And I think that I saw it available on Amazon for pre-order. Am, am I correct? Yeah, you can pre-order it now uh, from McFarland Publishers. Well, perfect. Thanks, Thanks again for your time. This has been really, really excellent. Oh, thank you. It's been fun. Oh, I'll tell you one last thing. Oh, please. You know, in the movie Jeremiah Johnson, yeah, they have him and his friend Del Gu. They put in there. They actually, the portrayal of Del Gu is actually more like the real historic Liberty Johnson. He comes up to this other mountain man who's buried in the sand with just his head sticking out, and, he, and then he later that becomes his partner, and they have some adventures together in the movie. That guy is actually more like the traditional Liberty Johnson than the Jeremiah Johnson figure. Okay. It's been so long since I've seen that film. So in a way, they actually did get the real historical Liberty Johnson in that movie, but he's the other character. Well, thank you for that insight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have a good one. All right. Okay. It's been fun. It has yeah. been. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. My guest again has been Nathan E. Bender, who wrote the introduction for the most recent edition of the classic Crow Killer, The Saga of Liver Eating Johnson. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobweb corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow. <laughs>